Philadelphia police officers showed up looking for answers about a murder from the night before. They took Tony in for hour after hour of questioning. I repeated the same thing over and over again. It wasn't me. I was in there crying like a baby for my mother. We talking about murder in the first degree. That's scary. It was an officer standing in the back of me, pressing down on my neck, and one almost nose to nose with me. I feared for my life at that time. So whatever they told me to do, I did. And they said I can go home if I signed these papers. There's an epidemic in America's criminal justice system. The prosecution and conviction of innocent people for crimes they did not commit. Welcome to the American Justice Podcast. Your hosts, Scott Pogansy and C. Derek Miller, come together to bring you the inside scoop on all of the wrongful conviction stories, both new and old. It's not only about the innocent who have been in prison, but also the victims of crimes as well. No one deserves justice more than them. And now, here are your hosts, Scott Pogansy and C. Derek Miller. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the American Justice Podcast. Where we talk shit. And we talk crime. But we, but never, we never talk, talk shitty crime. crime. What's going on, C. Derek? How are oh, you this week? Oh, man. What a week. You know, I, I, did, <laughs> I did a little experiment the other night. A, um, An experiment? Yes, yes. A, were there a, beakers involved? There were not beakers <laughs> involved. Uh, unless beaker is like slang term for something that I've never heard of. It's a possibility. Yes, it's slang uh, term yes. for glass dishes that you put solutions into. Ah, uh, uh, there there were glasses <laughs> and we were putting putting oh. putting the solutions. Easy we're for putting, you to say. So it was not putting <laughs> solutions in those beakers. I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. No, seriously, a uh, a heterosexual white male, a bisexual white female, a homosexual <laughs> white male, and a heterosexual black male all went <laughs> to a gay bar to sing karaoke this sounds like a uh, very interesting intro to a joke it it, it does and, but <laughs> but i don't i don't have a i don't have a joke but there is it. no joke it, it was an experiment we figured if the four of us all got together held mm-hmm. hands and sang kumbaya like, kumbaya or sweet caroline <laughs> one of the one of the two right. uh, that marjorie taylor green would appear behind us and try to kill one of us <laughs> She would suddenly appear. Yes, it was sud- suddenly appear, kind of, kind of uh, like uh, Candyman or uh, Bloody Mary or whatever. Right. Uh, Bloody Marjorie, at least one day out of the month. Well, one week out of the month. <laughs> Bloody Marjorie. <laughs> or I don't know. You know, she's she's getting kind of wrinkly there. You know, she might she might be past that part in her life. She might be all like men- menopause or she's mental pause for damn sure. But um, yeah, you never never know uh, when she's just going to pop up behind you. We we all held hands. And sang Sweet Caroline at the gay bar, and Marjorie Taylor Greene did not come up behind Did us. not come up. Well, as uh, one of those uh, aforementioned people, I won't say which, whether the gay male or the, the gay white male or the uh, heterosexual black male, they'll, yes. they'll just have to uh, <laughs> assume which one I am. But uh, I will say I had a really good time. It was fun. It, it, was, it was a great time. I mean... Man, like, can I can I just say something real quick? Sure, absolutely. You sang a song by Tesla called Signs. Yes. And I had actually never even heard this song before. And when I heard you sing it, I was like, "Wow, that's a really cool song." Like I I like the message of it, I like the tune, I like this the the music. And uh so I decided to go look up the uh, First of all, I was telling everybody what a great job you did. You're an a- amazing Thank you. singer. Thank you. And, uh, and I was like, man, this is, this is a really cool song. Like, I'm going to go look this up on YouTube. And I found it on YouTube. And can I just say, you did such a better job than the lead singer of that, of that band. <laughs> like, I much preferred your version to what they did. You know, they're, they're not even the original singers of that song. They, that is actually a cover of, uh, I, I'm, I don't know who, who did the original version. Well, it does sound kind of like hippie-ish, you know, it, it like does. it was written it's back very, in the 60s. Very, very like or, 60s message yeah. to it, yes. So that's why I was like, you know, when I was listening, I was obviously at karaoke, you can read the words, and I was reading the words, listening to the song, and I was like, this is a like a really cool song, really cool message. And uh, and yeah, like I said, I've, I told several people how good a job you did. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I wish, know, you know, it's funny because I got, I got video of you and Sam singing love shack which yes. was amazing b52s but i kind of wish i would have known 
that I, you know, that that song was going to play and that I was going to like it so much because I would have liked to have had a video of you singing it. So next time, you'll have to sing that song and we will uh, get a video of it and we will sure. give. A- ab- absolutely. I'm expecting the uh, the record contracts to start flowing. <laughs> in, uh, actually, uh, I want them delivered to the house by owls like in Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, right? I think a little, little too late in life to be a rock star. Well, um, I want to say that uh, next time we go, we will make a recording. We will play some for the American Justice podcast. Is that, is that not a great bar? It was a great bar. It was a great bar. Very, very kind of small and hole in the wall ish, which is cool. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name, and sometimes you don't. Yeah, because nobody <laughs> knows my damn name in there. <laughs> well, and, and what's funny is and, and this is. This is this is indicative of how good you were. The I think there were what three, two or three people before you, and when they finished, everybody was like, "Yeah, yeah, good job, good job, dude." I think you got a standing ovation. Like everybody was was yelling and screaming and clapping and like it was it was, it was really already late job. in the night. Everybody was all licked. Up. <laughs> everybody everybody sounds like Michael Bolton after midnight. <laughs> I don't know. I still think I'd I'd sound like a screeching owl or something. Hey, man, it's, and, you know, it's it's all about the even even if I get up there and suck, uh, I I don't care. No, uh, because you're... there's been quite a few times in karaoke night where I've just got up there and I've I've been so drunk that it didn't it didn't matter, <laughs> and uh, it didn't matter to anyone else either though. You know, because we were all three sheets to the wind by then. But uh, you know, it's it's all about having fun. You know, I'm 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 an author. I'm an attention whore. I like to get up in front of people and speak. I like to get up in front of people and sing. I just like to do things in front of people. I like to make people happy. I like to make people laugh. I like to make people happy. I, you know, I, I don't like making people sad, but that happens from time <laughs> to time. Uh, but I, I like, I like to bring joy to other people's life in one form of no, or another, whether that be you know, music or writing or, or, you know, any, anything, uh, just getting up and acting like an idiot because there's a lot of people who are, who are too embarrassed to get up and act like an idiot. I am not embarrassed to get up and act like an idiot. <laughs> and that reaction, that laughter that I bring to them sometimes by acting like an idiot is, uh, that brings joy to me. And it's something that I used to do weekly. And since the pandemic has started, I'm slowly starting to inch back into that life, whether it be singing or I, I know, um, you know, I was talking to a guy a couple of weeks ago who is uh, he's a guitar player. He's been performing in live bands for a big chunk of his life uh, in different places all over the world. And he's like, we need to start getting together and and doing some open mic nights. So going beyond the whole karaoke thing and actually you know, uh, singing some songs with a, with a band. So I'm, yeah. I'm all, I'm all for it, but I'm also starting to hit the, uh, the book scene again too. I've got a couple of, uh, book conferences coming up in the next few weeks. And, uh, I don't know if the pandemic is going away. It will probably never go away, but it's eased up enough to where I can start getting back, easing back into what is a normal lifestyle for me. Because I mean, let's be honest. I mean, you got a lot of things going on. I, I am not. I, I'm an introvert when there's a nasty disease outside the door, <laughs> but I'm I'm really an, an extrovert. I love getting out in front of other people and doing things and, and sharing things with them. And that that was my life before the pandemic, and it's been it's been really depressing. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, hopefully we're we've turned the corner, and you know, as long as we're safe and you know we're vaccinated and we're boosted and all that stuff you know hopefully we can uh, weather however long this sucker works how yeah, long i, I hope so cuz i'm i'm looking forward to uh you know selling books meeting people meeting slapping people. babies whatever Absolutely. you know well like i said next time we go karaoke i will definitely get uh, an audio file of of you singing that we will give a little taste to the uh, American Justice Podcast listeners. Oh yeah, yeah. If you want to dump your entire fan base like all in one episode, <laughs> sure. Nope, it will be amazing. Everybody will will applaud in their cars or in their. Do homes not or... applaud in your car. That's 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 the one. That's why I can't listen to hip hop while I drive. They're constantly telling me to put my hands in the air and wave them like I don't care. That is dangerous when you're going seventy miles an dangerous hour down the when highway. You're driving. Yep, that's right. Especially if you're like sitting at a stoplight and you're like applauding, like literally applauding, like like you know, 
not just like getting into the music, but you're like applauding and people see you, they'll be like, what the hell is oh, going I know. on with that guy? There's a cop behind you. He's going to be like, that, <laughs> that guy's an idiot. Guy. I wonder if there's a, like a recent crime I can tag on him. <laughs> But make make him a, a story yeah, on the American I, I Justice Podcast. I can podcast. wrap an entire case around this guy. That's my suspect right there. All right, nice. today we're going to be talking about a guy named Anthony Wright. You would think a story with a relatively happy ending would be easy to tell. I mean, we're talking about exoneration here. But what keeps getting to me during the course of my research is that a terrible crime was still committed. An innocent person still spent an unfair amount of time behind bars. And at least so far, those sworn to serve and protect haven't done much serving or protecting. Over time, the concept of, quote, innocent until proven guilty has become a cornerstone of our legal system. What is often forgotten is that this concept should apply to all of us equally under the law. Also, for every woman out there, that's like, where is my Mr. Wright? He's incarcerated, wrongfully, right here. <laughs> there's, I'm sure there's lots of Mr. Wrights incarcerated. Yes. I do believe that for more years than I can count, police work didn't have to be held accountable for the methods used to gain a conviction. It didn't seem like that a servant of the law would be called to the mat, so to speak. When an accusation leads to a court case, the officer, DA, or detective can just deny any wrongdoing or provide a, quote, justifiable excuse and often get away scot-free. How free? Scot-free. You said it, not me. <laughs> Qualified immunity has set precedents that have protected the unethical practices of law enforcement officials far too many years. I think that this would be a good time to interject that we here at the American Justice Podcast are very big supporters of the police we that are we absolutely believe in their uh their job and their cause and and you know by and large a vast majority of police officers are great wonderful law-abiding citizens and it just seems like that you know we're very critical of them because it's every case that we uh, that we feature has some element of police or prosecutor misconduct. So yeah, it's just like there's every every organization out there is only as good. It's not as as good as their strongest member. It's only as good as the loudest person they put the microphone in front of. And it always seems like they're putting the microphone in front of the village idiot. And that's what gives cops a bad rap. Is these cases are very high profile. They're always in the news. And who's to blame here? The investigators, you right, know, right. not every single person wearing a badge is out to get you. And we know this. I mean, 90 percent. I'll, I'll be as bold as to say 95 percent of the people wearing badges are not out to get you. But that 5 percent, man, that 5 percent who got this job for all the wrong reasons, whether it was they were abused by their parents or they were bullied in school. And this is the gateway to repaying society for the mental anguish that they endured during their raising. Right. That's that 5%. Those are the ones that are responsible for the episodes that we have to do on this podcast. Right. And I, and I think I've talked about this before. That, uh, you know, with my work at the children's hospital, it seems like, you know, all the kids that come in are just sick. So it makes you think that all kids are sick. And then you walk down the aisle at a grocery store and you see a kid that's happy and healthy and playing and jumping around. And, and it kind of reminds you, oh, yeah, that's right. Kids are supposed to be, you know, and, nine, and a vast majority, 95% of the kids are uh, happy and, and healthy and all of that stuff. But you know, when so when people see the American Justice podcast and they see us being critical of police, it just seems like that we're anti police, but we are absolutely no, we're, not. we're very pro law enforcement. I mean, I have a law enforcement background. I worked for the Hunt County Sheriff's Department for over a decade and right. I made several friends there. I'm, I'm still still friends with a lot of those people. I mean, I I wouldn't just have a bunch of crappy friends. That's That's <laughs> not what I do. That's not what I'm about. But working there every day led me to believe that 
everyone you come in contact with is out to get you or that they're some kind of dumb redneck. And then the more time I spend away from law enforcement, I have come to the conclusion that I was absolutely right. Everybody is out to get you, and most people are dumb rednecks. So... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it might just be a riskier endeavor these days to bank on special treatment for protection from accountability. Most recently, the innovation of cell phones has certainly made an impact on what police officers can try to get away with. Even recorded interrogations can or should be useful. But the one thing that you probably thought has been around for much longer than it really has and that can definitely unlock the truth to most mysteries is DNA evidence. Nope, it wasn't a thing until John Hammond uh, made dinosaurs. <laughs> That's right. At Jurassic Park. <laughs> well, you know what's funny is like, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, like they actually had testing for stuff like that, but they could really only tell like the blood type and yeah. stuff like that. But the DNA. Very rudimentary. Right. The DNA that we know and that we have come to expect over these years had really didn't start until late nineties. Yeah. I mean, you spit in a tube now, you throw it in the mail and they're like, wow, not only do you have COVID, you're related to Napoleon. <laughs> That's right. Whereas fingerprinting first introduced in 1892 by an Argentine chief of police is the most common type of physical evidence used to identify a suspect's possible involvement in a crime. The use of DNA is much more recent and still developing tool which can just as easily identify a person's innocence as it can verify their guilt. The study of DNA began in the 1860s by a Swiss chemist, but it wasn't until 1953 that DNA research and its applications really picked up speed. As recently as 1984, I know that sounds so last century to some of our listeners out there, but trust me, it wasn't that long it ago. It was not. Alec Jeffries developed the technique of DNA fingerprinting in his lab in the UK, whereby a person can be identified by the source of a biological sample by comparing the sample's DNA to the person's DNA. This revolutionized the field of criminal investigation. In 1986, DNA fingerprinting was first used in a forensic test for two rape-murder cases, and it continues to be fine-tuned and studied to this day. Law enforcement officials can be caught in their own webs of deceit a lot more easily these days by virtue of cell phone videos and DNA testing. Detectives may choose to make up their own stories during investigations and interrogations. Kind of reminds me of the Vincent Cosi case where nothing yes, was yes. recorded and it was all he said, he said, she said. Yes, and tape recorders have been around for a damn long <laughs> A lot time. longer than that. They may think up detailed accounts to write for their coerced confessions, but DNA doesn't lie. I guess you could say it's more ethical than some human beings. So it doesn't, doesn't say exactly where this guy's lab was just just that it was over in the uk somewhere. right and that I was just, just the beginning like i said it wasn't until the late 90s that it really started to become my my silly brain just imagines like a muppet in a lab <laughs> just, bork 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 today we're going to make it to dna <laughs> today we make it a dna <laughs> oh in the splooging in the sheet <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> sometimes uh, sometimes you get me, see, Derek. All right. I so do. as you may have guessed, DNA plays a starring role in our story today. It's the hero, if you will. You'll be able to identify the villains of the story by their use of wrongful conviction tactics, which we will try to get to the bottom of before we're done. We begin our story on October 19th of 1991, not too long after the use of DNA fingerprinting in police work got its start. The nude body of Louise Talley, a 77-year-old resident of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, was discovered in her bedroom on the second floor of her home. So much for the city of brotherly love. Not so much brotherly love here. No. She had been raped and stabbed 10 times in her neck. What the hell? Back and chest with a kitchen knife. Her home, sure it wasn't a, a 
22 inch sword yeah but 10 times in the okay neck, neck back, back and, chest. and chest at first i'm like 10 times in the neck i'm like geez <laughs> neck your so neck's on, not yeah. even that big how much of your neck would be left if someone stabbed you in it 10 times right well her home had been looted according to the police they were approached outside of louise's home and were told that then 20 year old anthony wright was involved in the crime Furthermore, this helpful citizen said that Anthony was staying nearby with a guy by the name of St. James. Ah. Police, is that better than uh, Inez yes, from last yes. week? St. James. St. <laughs> James. The patron saint of sparkly vampires. <laughs> That's right. Police followed up on this lead. Hey, good job, guys. And talked to Roland St. James and his roommate, John Richardson. Well, at least we have some... Some decent names this time. Oh, this the Swedish uh, DNA guy is like rubbing his little Muppet hands Herker together Berker. right now. I can hear it. The ruling St. James. And the roommate of the John Richardson. <laughs> so, upon admitting that he and John had dealings in crack cocaine, oh. Roland was taken into custody as a primary suspect in Luis's murder. Today we make it the glass dick. <laughs> It didn't help his case that Louise's TV was found in his house. What the hell? Score two points for the local investigator okay. procedure. Okay, back, maybe. back up. 1991. TVs were heavy as hell, man. Right. Who did not have... notice this dude lugging a TV from one house to another? Right. And you had to have two people yes. to well, carry that, that for sure. That is where John Richardson <laughs> came in. Right. Well, don't get too excited. For some reason, all Roland had to do was point a finger at someone else to save his hide. He signed a statement saying that Anthony told him he had stabbed a woman and brought him her TV to sell for him. I wonder if the police told Roland how Luis died. That's a very interesting, dare I say, incriminating detail if he had come up with it on himself. John Richardson, who was questioned by the police at the police station for almost 24 hours, Jeez. signed his own statement saying that Anthony asked him to be a lookout but he refused. He said he knew Louise and didn't want to break the law by breaking into her house. Oh, what a saint. Oh, no, that's the other guy. Yeah. No. Oh, so the strong ethical character of an alleged drug dealer and the things he might say to get out of a possible murder charge. There must be a lot of buses zooming by in Philly under which one can throw the nearest fall guy. For real, though, uh, I will I will say this. Uh, I was I was working in Philadelphia probably about five years ago. It was three in the morning, and I was looking for any type of little mom and pop cafe in the downtown area to be open, so I could you know get some breakfast, some coffee. Because I, I had a long day ahead of me, and I didn't want to fall asleep in the middle of it. I was working in a museum at the time, and um, I I got out of my truck. And uh, walked up to the cafe and just damn near stumbled over a dead body in the parking lot. Oh, my God. And, yeah, I mean, the cops were already there. They were just nowhere near the dead body. They were talking amongst themselves somewhere over in the shadows, probably trying to, you know, get their story straight, probably because they killed the guy. But, uh, right. you know, it's Philadelphia, brotherly love and all that. But, yeah, just, you know, good morning. Here, here's here's your dead body in the city of brotherly love. Uh, it's the, the only place I've ever like literally stumbled upon a dead body in Philadelphia. So, maybe they uh, maybe they named it that for irony. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> They're could, like, let's take the the be. most uh, uh, violent uh, city on <laughs> in well, the United know, States I, and we'll my, call it my uh, my job on this podcast. According to some people, is to just <laughs> talk trash on cities all over the country <laughs> because I've I've spent a lot of time in every single one of them. Uh, Philadelphia is one of the few places in this country where I just had an amazing, I mean, other than that one instance, I had, an, I've had amazing times in awesome. Philadelphia. It's the land of Rocky, isn't it? It is. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Rocky. Yeah. You can run up the steps and there's wow. that statue that, well, you know, well, I'm not about to run yeah, up anybody's steps. I was going to say, it, it's I don't physically even walk possible. up anybody's steps, but <laughs> I hear that there's a statue at the top of those things. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't know unless I was taking a picture with my drone or something. Yeah. No, it's, it's up there. Your Stories on Video is the perfect service to preserve all of your memories for generations to come. 
If you've ever thought to yourself that it's time to get all of those precious memories down on video, now is the time. Here's a quick sample of one of our videos. My name is Daryl Kaiser, and, and uh, I was uh, born uh, in 1925 in uh, Canby, Minnesota. The happiest day of my life. It has to be when I got married. Yeah, that, that would have to be my happiest day. I uh, sat down in a, in, a, in a chair that was several chairs, and there was women on the opposite side. And I looked, a guy ordered me a drink, and I, and I looked down that way, and, and Betty was looking at me. <laughs> So I winked at her. <laughs> and uh, the next thing I know, I, you know, was just, uh, then I went and asked her for a dance, and we we danced and and uh, so several times, and and uh, and then I asked to take her home. I can't say that I ever gets out of my mind at all. Daryl hired your stories on video because he wants his grandkids and their grandkids to hear from his own mouth and his own likeness what his life was like. He also shared the family ancestry as only he could. Going back and researching archives are one thing, but watching the person that lived it is so much better. The process to get a video is very simple. Just go to www.yourstoriesonvideo.com and request a consultation. Then one of our experienced story consultants will work with you from the beginning to the end to make sure your video is exactly what you want it to be. Many kinds of individuals and families utilize our service, from the older generation wanting to pass down their wisdom to those that have an unfortunate medical diagnosis. Contact Your Stories on Video today at yourstoriesonvideo.com. Mention the American Justice Podcast and receive a 25% discount. All right, well, not to disparage the efforts of the investigative team in Philly that day, but despite following where the clues sort of led them, I get the feeling they moved off of John and Roland and onto Anthony a bit too quickly. I'd like a little less hearsay in my evidence, please. I mean, if they intended to follow the confession coercion playbook, they had two guys with stolen property from the victim's home in custody already. But, as I'm sure you've guessed, the police's next stop was Anthony Wright's home. Right, because the, the one guy's like, look, you know, I'm, I'm all about getting a new TV. I'm, I'm not going to be your lookout because I just... I don't want to. I don't want to kill that lady because it's it's against the law. It's you know, it breaking I, I the law. I don't want to kill that lady because she's cool and she's like <laughs> seventy seven and old and sweet and she hadn't done anything. No, it's right. just you know it's illegal. Right. I just don't want to kill her because it's illegal. Or not even not even that. But if that if someone comes to you and says, "Hey, I want you to be a lookout because I'm going to kill this lady and take all of her stuff." Wouldn't you call the police and be like, uh, hey, this yeah. guy just told me this. You know, hey, this, like this guy just said he's going to go over here and kill this lady. You, you, you guys might want to get there. Instead of trying to save your own hide because you've got the stolen property in your apartment. How much? It was 1991. 1991. How much you want to bet that it was one of those like combo TV VCRs? <laughs> Probably had a like a copy of Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure stuck in it because she lost the remote. She couldn't get it to eject. Right. Just probably the crappiest TV imaginable. And it was like blinking 12 o'clock. Yeah, it couldn't, couldn't <laughs> set the clock. God, that's something that people don't have to worry about nowadays. I know, isn't Everything's that, hooked up to Wi-Fi. It syncs up automatically with the clock. Yeah. I, I had a VCR for 20 years that blinked noon. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know. <laughs> I know. I was there. I mean, not where you were, but I had the same thing. On October 20th, 1991, Anthony was watching football while his four-year-old son, aw, sat beside him playing with his toys when the police knocked on the door. Having no idea what could be wrong, he cooperatively went down to the station after being allowed to change his clothes. Well, that was sweet of him. Right? Three detectives, Martin Devlin, Frank... Yeah, Frankie. What kind of name is that? Jasimbersky. And <laughs> Jasimbersky. <laughs> Jastrimbisky. Lip Jast Biscuit. Frank J., 
Frankie J. And Manuel Santiago got yes. the nine page typed confession they needed in just two hours. It took him two hours to type nine pages. Right. He's well, guilty. I mean, that seems quick to me. Doesn't that seem quick to you? I mean, I'm I've been working on this podcast for hours and I'm not even done with page three. Maybe I'm slow. Wait, am I slow? I'd like You're not slow. <laughs> I'd like to think I'm just being thorough. Hmm. Maybe podcasts and good police work should have something in common. But I digress. Is is there a podcast where police officers talk about cases like this? Oh yeah, I'm sure. Or there are. is it one of those political things where and, and I'm sure this is this is how it would be. If I was still working for the Hunt County Sheriff's Department right now, I can tell you for a fact that whoever was in charge would be like, Hey, I heard you're doing a podcast about uh like unsolved cases or wrongfully accused and you need to pick a job, man. Either you're going to work here with us or you're going to, you're going to be a radio host or, <laughs> because they, they did that to me as a writer. When I worked there, they're like, they're like, uh, one of them stumbled across my, my space page. Yeah. Let's, let's date me. Why don't we? <laughs> a little uh, bit. One of them stumbled across my minds, my, my space page, Your mind space, my mind space, <laughs> my, my space page. And, uh, you know, I said I wanted to murder my parents, but they could never find that MySpace page again. <laughs> no. Uh, and that I as, hated them. Yes. And, yeah. uh, recall all the way back to season one. Go to the American Justice Podcast season one and find the reference I'm speaking of. <laughs> no, actually, they uh, they printed out my entire MySpace page, and uh, they're like, look, you either need to be one of us or you be a writer, but you can't be both because you write about – the spooky stuff and the scary wow, are stuff. You serious? Yes, and so for an entire like nine months, because uh, I knew there was there was an election coming up. This this is, came straight from the sheriff. It came from the top. Mm -hmm. um, I knew there was an election coming up. I knew the old man wasn't going to run again. I knew for a fact who the new sheriff was going to be, and he was a supporter of my extracurricular activities. So I just had to keep it all silent for nine whole months. But I was given that ultimatum. Wow. Either either work here and have a paycheck or go be a writer and, you know, not have a paycheck because writers don't make jack. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of course. That's crazy, man. I can't, you know, I can't, I can't even imagine that. Like, you know, when I was working at the hospital, they encouraged you to have other, you know, extracurricular activities. All right. In the signed confession, Anthony admitted to raping and killing Louise after breaking into her home to rob her so he could buy crack. The statement said that he was wearing a Chicago Bulls sweatshirt. Guilty. <laughs> oh, God. In 1991, that was still during the Jordan years. Oh, that's true. Oh, man. I was probably wearing a Chicago Bulls <laughs> sweatshirt in 1991. Right. Jeans and Fila shoes that were still in his bedroom. He was charged with capital murder, rape, robbery, burglary, theft, and weapons violations. Because as we learned last week, you can kill somebody, but not with a weapon. <laughs> I'm, that's another thing that's always killed me. Uh, uh, sitting in a courtroom for as long as I did. Just what, what are the point of these lesser charges? That, Just, yeah. Well, and, I, and how could you be found guilty of, like, let's say... You could be found guilty of the guilty of the robbery, burglary, and theft, but not of the rape and the murder. Like yeah. it doesn't make sense. Like you the know? top, the top charge is going to. I hate to use this word, but trump everything <laughs> else. Overrun. Yeah, it's just it's, it's going to <laughs> take precedence. Every everything else, you know, if they happen to find you not guilty of that top charge, right. Then maybe you go okay, but well, let's let's see if you raped them at least, though, or maybe you robbed them, or yeah, you know. But in cases like this, it's it's you know it's not fathomable to think that that the, that you raped and and stole her stuff, but didn't kill her, you know, yeah. like that. Just all right. Not sure how these various shades of gray were arrived upon, but maybe the police couldn't tell if force was used against a woman who was raped and stabbed repeatedly. No, Ooh. she welcomed it. Mm -mm, as, nope. As never has been said in the history right, of time. Right, exactly. Oh no, that that wasn't. Uh, that was. Uh, you yeah. know, she said I could do that. That was consensual rape. Yeah, it was consensual no. rape. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. No. The order. The next order of business for the police was to obtain a search warrant for Anthony's home. Later, they said they found blood-stained clothes in his room. Things are not looking good for Anthony. 
For now, let's just say that information regarding conflicting, some might even say false testimony, might be coming your way. Isn't that normal though for like people in Philadelphia to just have bloody clothes? I mean, I didn't, mean, you didn't know. Rocky work at like a slaughterhouse? <laughs> right. Uh, this this is what is my work uniform. <laughs> and, in May of 1993, after spending almost two years in prison awaiting trial, the case was heard at the Philadelphia County Court of Common Pleas. Roland St. James and John Richardson testified, implicating Anthony in the murder. Seems like it would have been a pretty easy to discredit a couple of drug dealers, but maybe that's just on TV. Two teens, Greg Alston and Sean Nixon, testified that they and another friend, Antonio Johnson, saw Anthony go into Louise's home. Antonio didn't testify, but the police said that he signed a statement confirming the testimony of the other two boys. Oh, dear. I do hope the police have more to go on than this eyewitness testimony. If not, they may be forced to fabricate something more incriminating. And if they need any help with that, uh, the... <laughs> phone number to the texas rangers is <laughs> right uh, they, i'm sure it's i'm sure it's 512 it's google and it's in your pocket it is google and it is in <laughs> your pocket enter the detective's testimony they said they found bloody clothing in anthony's room remember well if you're british that's cool though <laughs> i found the bloody clothing in my room mate. that's right which doesn't actually uh, okay well they testified <laughs> to that fact in court as well a crime lab analyst also testified that he found blood on the sweatshirt and jeans that matched Louise's blood type. He said semen was found on the jeans that could have been Anthony's. The analyst couldn't go any further than could have been. No way to be a bit more certain while you're implicating someone for a rape and a murder. Because if you have someone else's semen on your blue jeans, then that's just a more interesting story altogether. <laughs> that would be a whole side yes. story. Can we do an episode on, <laughs> on that? Can we do an episode of uh, whose semen was on his blue jeans? <laughs> that's right. If not his, whose was it? Well, we're not going to leave that testimony unanswered. We've got a mama bear to hear from. Anthony's mother... Myrtle Martin Myrtle testified. It's that's such an my grandmother's It is such name an old name, Myrtle. isn't it? Like yes. you don't hear like an eighteen year old. Hi, my name's Myrtle. Yeah, my grandmother's <laughs> name was Myrtle. That's Myrtle awesome. May. Myrtle May. Uh -huh. Well, this is Myrtle Martin. Myrtle Martin. She testified that the detective searched her home on the day he resigned or he signed that nine page confession. They left his room with only a white work jumpsuit, not a Chicago Bulls sweatshirt, jeans, or shoes. Furthermore, she said Anthony did not own the clothing in question. See? Conflicting testimony. Whom should we believe? Two drug dealers, three teens that allegedly saw someone enter a house, or a mom? Now, he's guilty of something, though, if he's wearing clothing that doesn't belong to him. <laughs> I, I've never, ever, ever in my life, I've, I knew people who did this, mostly girls. They borrow each other's clothing. Yeah. In 1991, men did not borrow each other's clothing. Not or at usually. least I don't I don't I don't think well so. maybe if you're a, a roommate situation. Eh, still and, no. You know, no? No, okay. never. Not not me. I've I've never borrowed someone else's clothing. I just no. I mean, especially like like bottom stuff, like like <laughs> pants or shorts or underwear. I mean Well some, definitely not underwear. No, but, I, mean, I mean but even even blue jeans. I mean, you know, it's it's cloth mask theory here in COVID. I mean, you know, the underwear is not gonna stop a fart. And I'm not going to walk around in somebody else's fart all day. So, you, so you're going to hear a, a quick funny story about of this. Of course I do. So as you, as most uh, listeners are aware, uh, you know, I'm, I have a, a distinct size. So I am obviously not borrowing most people's clothes because they're a lot smaller than me. Well, I do have a friend that is about my same size. And one time I was uh, staying, uh, watching his house. And uh, I forgot what happened, but I like went swimming or something. So I needed a, a dry shirt to put on. So I went into his closet, found a shirt, put it on. Totally forgot that I did it. And, uh, you know, so I had this shirt. It was just a T-shirt. It wasn't, it wasn't anything special. And uh, one day <laughs> I'm hanging out with him and his wife. This is probably a couple years later. And, uh, and she said, you know, my husband used to have a shirt like that. <laughs> Wow. And it, it then hit me. I was like, oh, my God, I just remembered that I totally store, stole his shirt. No, I never, never wore. <laughs> I, 
two, well, it could be that I have I had two two friends growing up, like two true friends growing up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe four. Maybe I'll either either way. None of those four guys were my size, right? So <laughs> uh, you know, I wasn't I wasn't borrowing their clothes. But right. But even even if they were, I mean, like you know, maybe a pair of socks. You know, <laughs> if maybe, you're in dire need, maybe yeah. yeah. If I was in dire need, because I hate I hate wearing like like shoes with no socks. Maybe socks. Yeah. You know, just no. All just right. can't do it. All right. Well, now most defendants do not testify on their own behalf for several reasons. They usually can't handle the stress. They might become agitated, irritable, or nervous. Even if they are innocent, the jury might interpret their nerves as a sign of guilt. Most importantly, testifying on your own behalf in a criminal case should be unnecessary because you are not required to prove your innocence. It is the burden of the prosecutor to prove your guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. But testify, Anthony did. He denied even being in Louise's house, let alone raping and killing her. He said he didn't know Roland St. James, John Richardson, or any of the three boys who claimed to see him enter her home. He had never seen any of these witnesses before. Okay, now this is getting interesting. I'm right. to see where this goes. Right. It's like, uh, no, wait a second. Not only was I not there, but I don't even know any of these people that's I saying mean, that's, that I was there. That's like, in my mind, is not only is it the law and order like sound effect but it's like spicy law and order sound effect. right it's like dong 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 dong, dong. <laughs> anthony testified that on the night of october 18th 1991 he worked all day he returned home around 5 p.m went to a club around 11 p.m and came home around 4 a.m on the next day october 19th he slept until 10 a.m that day went shopping with friends and then went to a concert sounds like a busy couple of days maybe too busy to squeeze in a break-in, rape, and murder. But, but those are my words, not his. Anthony denied the clothing that was allegedly found in his room was his. The shoes and evidence were a size 11, and he wore a nine and a half. Hmm. Any jeans he could fit into would have to have a 38-inch waist. The jeans the police claimed to have found were two sizes smaller than that. If the jeans and the shoes don't fit, you must see Derek. Acquit. <laughs> I know that logic worked one other time, but that's probably not the defense I think it is. Anyway, Anthony also testified that the confession was false. During his interrogation, one detective held him by the back of his neck while another got in his face, noses touching, aggressively invading his personal space. He was handcuffed to his chair and told the police had evidence and witnesses. He only signed the confession after a lengthy interrogation during which the detectives threatened him with physical and sexual assault if he didn't cooperate. (laughs) What? One detective said he would poke his eye out and skull fuck him. I know I'd be shaking in my innocent boots at this point. He tried to read what he was being asked to sign, but the detectives covered it up. He was told that he could go home if he signed it. Then they told him what he had just signed and confessed to. Philadelphia police officers showed up looking for answers about a murder from the night before. They took Tony in for hour after hour of questioning. I repeated the same thing over and over again. It wasn't me. I was in there crying like a baby for my mother. We talking about murder in the first degree. That's scary. It was an officer standing in the back of me, pressing down on my neck, and one almost nose to nose with me. I feared for my life at that time. So whatever they told me to do, I did. And they said I can go home if I signed these papers. Tony signed a confession written by the officer stating that he had raped and murdered an elderly woman. Police also testified that they found blood-stained clothes in his home. He narrowly missed the death penalty before being sentenced to life in prison. That's insane. That, that is insane. Like, 
it's just hard to even imagine that. No one's going to skull fuck anyone at work. They're going to wait until they get home. <laughs> That's right. On June 8th, 1993, Anthony was convicted of capital murder, rape, theft, burglary, unlawful entry, robbery, and illegal use of a weapon. Surprised they didn't throw in like an illegal left turn or something. Yeah, right. Uh, jaywalking. Yeah, I'd be. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd. I'd probably say murder is an illegal use of a weapon. All right. Maybe they could have let the theft charges go, considering. I mean, big picture, please. Luckily for Anthony. The jury could not reach a unanimous verdict when it came to the death penalty. Voting 7-5 to five in favor of death, the jury had to settle with sentencing him to life in prison without parole. This would definitely have been a fair sentence for such a grisly crime, if only they had the right guy. In 2005, Anthony asked for DNA testing of the evidence against him. In 2006, a judge denied the request because of the signed confession. When he tried to appeal the decision, the Pennsylvania Superior Court upheld the ruling. In 2011, the court set aside their decision and sent the case back to the trial court. They ruled that a confession does not mean DNA cannot be tested. In 2013, brace yourselves here, consider it braced. Two years later, in 2013, DNA tests on the clothing showed Louise's DNA inside the sweatshirt and jeans. Louise's DNA. The sweatshirt and jeans were worn by Louise because they were her clothes, not Anthony's. The detectives had falsely claimed that they found the clothes in Anthony's room when they really found them in Louise's home. Didn't I tell you DNA was the hero of this story? But wait, it gets better. DNA testing of the rape kit uncovered the DNA profile of one Ronnie Bird. Bird was a crack dealer who lived near Louise. He died in a South Carolina prison in 2013. He was 62. Good riddance, and may he rest in pieces. So the the (laughs) guy who did it wasn't even a name we've heard before. Right, exactly. This random crack dealer from down the street. Yep. Oh, it's random Ronnie. But it does make you wonder about the motivations of all these people that said they saw Jeez, what the hell is going on in this neighborhood? I don't know. In 2000, maybe they had another beef. You never know what people's motivations are. In March of 2014, the DA's office vacated Anthony Wright's conviction. Seriously, though, I thought justice was supposed to be swift, but we're not quite at the finish line yet. The prosecution decided to come up with a completely new tactic. They suggested that Anthony and Bird committed the crime together and requested a second trial, which began in August of 2016, despite the overwhelming DNA evidence. Man, we all know how this ends, but this is still so stressful. I see where this is leading. Yep. Jordan shirt. (laughs) Bird. Bird. Ah, there's a rivalry there. Yes. <laughs> Celtics. NBA, didn't know we were going to go NBA with That's it, right. Celtics like versus Bulls. Good NBA. That's right. The, the legends. All right. So Roland St. James and John Richardson had passed away at this point. So their testimony from the 1993 trial was read aloud to the jury. What kind of BS is that? In my layman's opinion, that's not really fair since the defense couldn't cross-examine them. The two teenage witnesses who testified at the first trial that they saw Anthony enter Louise's house testified at the second trial as well. They said that their testimony in 1993 was false and had been coerced by the police. Please tell me you're not surprised by this. Appalled maybe, but not surprised. Antonio Johnson, the third teen who only submitted a written statement the first time, testified that he did not see Anthony when he was with the other two boys. Oh, how the case begins to crumble. I love our episodes, too. We start out with, hey, we just want to let you know that we love the police and we support the police. And then, (laughs) like, midway through the episode, they're like, they made the whole thing up. (laughs) As for the prosecution, they tried to cast doubt on the new testimony given by their once star teenage witnesses by using their original testimony from 1993. I'm thinking it's all about the win column for some prosecutors. They reminded the jury about Anthony's confession in lieu of evidence, I'm guessing. The detectives still insisted they found the bloody clothes in Anthony's bedroom 
and that his confession was voluntarily given. Well, I mean, of course they did. I mean, they had to coerce and fabricate evidence in the first place. Their only choice now was to sing the same song, second verse. Or they could just ask a crack dealer to do it. It seems like those guys are just running They're, right they're plentiful. They're just yes. running down the street. Pick one off a tree. <laughs> Remember, I said that the hero of this story is DNA evidence. Well, there's another hero, and thank goodness for that. Anthony was represented for his retrial by Innocence Project lawyers. Okay. It is thanks to the tireless work of the Innocence Project senior staff attorney Nina Morrison, co-founder Peter Neufeld, Samuel Silver, and Rebecca Latcher of Schneider, Harrison, Siegel, and Lewis, LLP, that Anthony finally got his shot at real justice. What's more heroic than that? For the second time, Anthony testified on his own behalf. Surely that would be more reliable than the testimony of a couple of dead drug dealers. For one thing, the cross-examination would be much easier. I mean, dead guys tell no tales and all that. Well, that's what the Pirates of the Caribbean ride told me at Disneyland anyway. <laughs> that's right. Hey, are dead guys more ethical than some human beings? At least they can't lie anymore. Yeah, they lie flat six feet down. <laughs> six feet down. Anthony again denied any involvement in the crimes he was convicted of. Recalling memories he will likely never forget, he told the jury all about the lengthy interrogation, threats, and intimidation he suffered through the hands of the detectives all those years ago. And they were going to give him a Cuisinart and uh, <laughs> a timeshare at Holly Lake Ranch. Buy two confessions, get one free. Yes. <laughs> the and a moped. The jury also got to hear the other interesting evidence, perhaps equally as compelling as Anthony's testimony. The DNA results that proved Anthony's innocence linked Ronnie Bird to the crime. Ronnie, who was friends with our neighborhood crack dealers, Roland St. James and John Richardson, was an addict who didn't even know Anthony, nor did Anthony know him. And just like Ronnie saying, be my little baby, baby my darling, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I'm sensing something quite a bit beyond a shadow of a doubt brewing in, but especially when all of the evidence presented is taken together. It's more like a storm of doubt, a tsunami, if you will. On August 23rd of 2016, after deliberating for less than an hour, the jury reached its verdict. Anthony was acquitted and released, thereby becoming the 344th person in the nation to be exonerated by our hero, DNA. Finally, in 2011, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruled in favor of Tony and allowed the DNA testing. It proved that Tony did not match any of the DNA at the scene and pointed to a different man. Instead of setting Tony free, the Philadelphia District Attorney demanded a retrial. 25 years later, Tony's fate would again be in the hands of a jury. I've never felt so secure about anything in my life like I felt going to trial. I couldn't wait for that day. After hearing all the evidence and really paying attention to what was being said in that courtroom, each of us realized this man was not guilty. First degree murder, second degree murder, third degree murder, rape, etc. down the line, not guilty. Not guilty. And I screamed so loud, it felt like a million pounds was lifted off my back. After that, you can hear my son in the back sobbing. As he remembers it, the foreman, quote, screamed, not guilty, to the heavens, as if she was talking directly to my mother. Or being filmed, <laughs> where it would be replayed day after day on CNN, and she would get movie deals. That's right. He filed a federal civil rights lawsuit against the city of Philadelphia and the police department. In June of 2018, the suit was settled for $9.85 million. Good what? for him. Yes, that is way beyond a Walmart salary. Good job, sir. That comes to $394,000 for every year that he was in prison. Not bad as settlements go, but I'd rather be free than rich. Since his exoneration, Anthony has been fighting for others like himself who are seeking compensation for being wrongfully convicted. You know, it's bad enough that law enforcement maliciously went after Anthony in the first place, but even the second trial was filled with corruption. In August of 2018, just two years after Anthony's acquittal, 
The Innocence Project lawyers filed a complaint against Bridget Kern, the prosecutor handling Anthony's case in 2016. The complaint accused her of knowingly allowing retired homicide detectives Santiago and Jay Jay. to testify falsely. During the retrial, the detectives testified that they didn't know much about the post-conviction DNA testing and results. However, in sworn depositions for the civil lawsuits, they said that Kern had informed them in detail about the DNA evidence before the retrial began. She never corrected the detective's false denial of facts that she herself had briefed them on in preparation for the trial. Bridget Kern and 31 members of the Philadelphia DA's office were terminated in January 2018 when Larry Krasner, good guy alert, was elected as the DA. Can you imagine, though, you said he uh, he's helping other people uh, get get their money. Right. Yeah. When you have structured settlements and you need cash now, uh, <laughs> however that commercial goes, right. no, he's, he's, he helps. Other, I mean, he, if he doesn't go get his law degree, it, it, it's a wasted business opportunity. Like, have you been wrongfully in- convicted? Call the Philadelphia Falcon. And then, ah, there's like a noise come in. It's like, call Mr. Wright. Yeah. It, <laughs> I'm telling you, missed opportunity. If, if you're listening, do it. You know, Anthony, <laughs> if, if you're listening, I'm not going to put a claim on that. You know, the whole Philadelphia Falcon. <laughs> I'm not going to copyright that or anything. But, you know, we can talk. You do have like $9 million just right. chilling out. I, I'm, I'm a consultant. Yes, I, I am a um, consultant. But wait, there's more. There's always more. Let's talk again about Detective Martin Devlin because the other shoe is about to drop. The dominoes, they will fall. Listen to this. Sharoon Thomas and Clayton Mustafa Thomas Jr. are brothers who were exonerated in 2017 and 2019 of a murder in Philadelphia. One of the detectives who worked on the case, Martin Devlin. Of course. Willie Vesey was exonerated in 2019 of a 1992 murder, also in Philadelphia. Want to take a guess at who had given the false confession to it? You got it. Martin Devlin with the help of Detective Paul Worrell. Walter Ogrod was exonerated and released from Pennsylvania's death row in 2020. This means that the four-year-old he had falsely been convicted for murdering didn't get justice either. The scumbag who really did it got away with it. You see, there are always at least two victims in wrongful conviction stories. Always. Oh, and do you want to know and take another guess at who obtained a false confession from Walter? I'll give you two clues, Devlin and Worrell. Oops, I mean, I'll give you two answers, Martin Devlin and Paul Worrell. These guys. (laughs) Andrew Swainson was exonerated of a Philadelphia murder in 2020 as well. He had been in prison for more than 31 years. The investigating detective, our good buddy, Manuel Santiago, who worked with Devlin. All in all... A dozen men have been released from life sentences whose convictions involved the detectives that worked on Anthony's case. A dozen men and counting. That's insane. That is insane. After he was finally free, Anthony said of his Innocence Project lawyer, Nina Morrison, quote, My case was a Pandora's box and she knew it, and she would expose all the corruption that was going on in the judicial system in Philadelphia. And true to her word, My case has opened the door for men that were literally dead men walking and opened the door for so many people to come home after me, end quote. In August 2021, Santiago, Devlin, and Jay, Jay. Jastrem Zambiski, I'm I'm trying it, Jastra Zambiski. Sounds like something you order at like an Afghani restaurant. (laughs) Right. Well, they all face charges of perjury and false swearing in connection with their testimonies in Anthony's retrial and civil rights lawsuit. D.A. Krasner stated, quote, The 31st Philadelphia County Investigating Grand Jury has heard evidence and has issued a presentment in which they recommend criminal prosecution of three former Philadelphia police homicide detectives for lying in 2016, both in and out of court, about their on-duty roles in the investigation interrogation, and wrongful conviction of an innocent man, Anthony Wright, which occurred in 1993. 
The grand jury determined that the detectives coerced a false confession while physically threatening Anthony. The jurors also made note of the fact that the detectives promised Anthony he could go home if he signed the confession. And they claimed Anthony read the document even though they prevented him from doing exactly that. Although the statute of limitations has expired for some of their behavior in the original case, the grand jury reviewed the retrial and the depositions from the civil lawsuits and found that Devlin and Santiago once again falsely stated that Anthony willingly confessed to the crimes. All three detectives falsely testified under oath about the evidence used to convict Anthony and their awareness of the DNA results that cleared him. God, wouldn't it be nice if something like this could happen locally? <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to call any names or right. anything. No, I can't imagine. The grand jury's recommendation for these three detectives was that they be held, quote, accountable for lying under oath to condemn an innocent man and cover up their wrongdoing and for perverting the integrity of law. Manuel Santiago now faces prosecution on two counts of perjury and two counts of false swearing for false testimony for his part in the Santiago Devlin confession at the 2016 retrial and in relation to the civil rights deposition. As for falsely testifying about his knowledge of the DNA evidence, he was charged with one count of perjury and one count of false swearing. Martin Devlin has been charged with two counts of perjury and two counts of false swearing for false testimony as it pertains to the Santiago Devlin confession. Frank J. was the number five on the menu (laughs) at the restaurant, was charged with two counts of perjury and two counts of false swearing for the 2016 and 2017 deposition as a result of his testimony about the search of Anthony's home. He was also charged with one count of perjury and one count of false swearing for false testimony regarding prior knowledge of the DNA results, just like Santiago. Final judgment may take a while. It's a process, as I'm sure you know. I guess justice is slow for everybody. As it now stands, the detectives are facing an open and active criminal investigation, which will be tried by the District Attorney's Office Conviction Integrity Unit and Special Investigations Unit. But at least Turnabout is still fair play, and Karma can definitely be a bitch. Yeah, you got to wonder what uh, like a, the punishment is for all of this. You know, I, I hope Probably it's, six months in county jail. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would hope that it's it's rather lengthy, but I'm, I'm sure it's going to be like a slap on the wrist. And right. Don't do it again. Right, exactly. Plus, they're probably all really old anyways. But. Yeah. Remember when I mentioned Anthony's then four-year-old son playing next to him on the day that he was brought into the police station? All through his father's incarceration, Anthony Wright Jr. remained close to his father. In 2016, the Innocence Project asked Anthony Sr. to discuss what his son means to him for their Innocence blog, appropriately timed for Father's Day. Here's how Anthony described his connection to his son. Quote, As human beings, we go through things in life and we just don't know that we can get through them until we do just that. We get through them. The reason I've been able to get through this situation is my son. My son, even when he's not in front of me, he's in front of me. He's with me all of the time. He's the air I breathe. He's my everything. To hear his voice, he gives me the strength I need. It's said that it takes a village to raise a child. That's been especially true in my case. He was four years old when this tragedy occurred. Now he's 28. I don't know what it was between he and I, but we've always had a bond, and I've always held his attention. He used to come see me when he was a little boy. When he was here, he would stare at me. He would barely blink. He just kept his eyes on me. There was a vending machine in the visiting room. He would go to the vending machine, but he would walk backwards so that he could keep his eyes on me. He was afraid that if he turned away, I wouldn't be there when he turned back around. The bond that we share is beyond anything that I could ever have imagined. Over the course of 24 years, he's never wavered. He's never stopped believing in me. I get up every morning because of him. End quote. 
feel free to grab a tissue at this point in time if you need one. Nobody's going to judge you for that. And for those of you out there keeping your own tally sheet at home, in this case, you can attribute another wrongful conviction to false confessions, perjury, and false accusations, and our recurring, ever-present star of many investigative processes, official misconduct. You know, my son would not do that to me if, if that was the case. It would, no, he'd be like, no, dad's a creep. <laughs> dad, dad did that shit, and I just want you to know that, no, I'm, I'm keeping my eyes on him because I'm afraid of what <laughs> he might do to me if I turn my if back. If I turn my back. I, I don't have a sob story for you. I don't have words of encouragement. Just go on, let somebody else write that damn blog because my dad sucks. <laughs> right. I'm going to take a moment to editorialize here. These frustrating cases are inspiring me to search my mind for solutions in regard to our current method and practices. I was thinking we need more level-headed, empathetic, compassionate, and fair-thinking people in the justice system, in every position and at every level. And I don't mean people who would be soft on crime. So if you're a right-leaning listener, hold your hate mail. I think what we maybe need is fewer men. Sorry, guys, but track records don't lie, just like honest and DNA and dead men who tell no tales and more women working in criminal cases. A woman's touch isn't just for housework, you know. But then it came to me. What we really need is for dogs to take over the world. Pure hearts, loyal minds, honest souls. Dogs would make much better people than the rest of us do. Well, also, I mean, most people who run for political office, it doesn't doesn't matter if it's like county attorney, district attorney, or the president of the United States. Most of these politicians start out very well-to-do, very pampered, very wealthy people. And what do wealthy, powerful people want from this world? They want more wealth wealth and more more power. power. That's right. And they get into these positions of wealth and power, and they're just constantly looking for more wealth and power. We need to start putting your average Joe in office. That's what we need to do. Yep. You know, maybe start going to Walmart and, and like asking these door greeters. They're like, hey, you want to raise? Right. If you're interested in reading more in depth about Anthony Wright's consequential case, He and Rob G. Kelly have written a self-published memoir called Live to Tell, The Trial, Conviction, and Exoneration of Anthony Wright. It's available in hardcover on Amazon for $28.99. I'm surprised a traditional publisher didn't pick that up. I'm surprised that's self-published. I agree. So do we have any final thoughts here today, C. Derek? Ah, Man, uh, this guy was put through the ringer by uh, a bunch of dishonest, I guess, neighbors, a bunch of dishonest cops, just dishonesty all over the place. And this poor guy ended up taking the fall for all of this for a very long time. And, uh, you know, he talks about, you know, his son sticking by him from like age four to age 28. I mean, that's that's got to be heartbreaking because you, you think about how much he missed. Yeah, he missed his whole growing up. Yeah, is is everything. I mean, that's that's just absolutely horrible. But I think you know, in all these cases, you know, there's always many, many, many victims. You know, the the sons, the daughters, the the relatives, the aunts, the uncles, the mothers, the father. You know, it's like when someone's wrongfully convicted, it's not just um, it's not just them that suffers. Right. You know, the crazy sister. I mean, <laughs> the. So anyways, all right. Well, that'll do it for this week's uh, episode of the American Justice Podcast. Remember to stay aware, stay strong, and get involved. Bye. Next week. The American Justice Podcast is owned and copyrighted by Atua Productions, LLC of Dallas, Texas. Your hosts are Scott Pogansey and C. Derek Miller. Atua Productions aims for this to be an interactive podcast where you, the audience, has a great amount of influence on the content of our shows. You can interact with us in several ways. First, and most preferred, is you can leave us a voicemail. Our phone number is 972-942-0444. Be sure to leave your name and city you're calling from, along with whether or not we can use your voice on the air. 
If Facebook is more your style, you can log on to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash American Justice Podcast. Feel free to leave a comment or you can message us on Messenger if you have a more pressing question or issue. If you'd like to blog about the show, you can log on to AmericanJusticePodcast.com and let us know what you think there. If you're a tweeter, you can also voice your opinion on Twitter at A Justice Podcast. We would very much appreciate it if you could give us a five-star review on all the podcast streaming platforms. 